Hey everybody, it's Brian, and in this video we're going to talk about the Q Byte Array, or basically an array of bytes. I like to nickname this the best array ever, and there's a reason for that. I absolutely hate working with C++ arrays. I hate them with a passion. Yes, they're great, they're convenient, and for newbies these seem like you're just in God mode, but really, once you get into more advanced programming, you constantly find yourself having to resize these and do things with them and it just becomes a royal pain. So let's dive in and take a look and see why I love the Qbyte array. All right, so first thing we need to do is, well, start at the beginning. We need to actually create an array. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to say Qbyte array. Let's call this stuff. Now you may be going, no, wait a minute, you never included it. It's already built right in, so you don't need to. It's right in Qt Core. Now, before we really jump in, just remember, highlight it and hit F1, that brings up the help file. The help file is your friend if you have questions or concerns or if you get lost. And kind of scrolling through this, you can see right off the bat, append. That's right. You can modify this array dynamically. This is pretty awesome. Now there's other things out there in C++ land that do this, but I don't think they do it quite this well, which is why I get so super psyched up about this. So I'm gonna say Qinfo. Let's go ahead and output our stuff. So we just have a blank byte array, and we're just gonna output it. The first thing you're gonna note when we output this is that Qinfo treats this like it's a string. That's important for later on in this video when we talk about encoding. That's right, this class has encoding built right into it. I absolutely love that. So let's dive into some of the other constructors. And you can, as you might imagine, just take this to some sort of extreme, but I'm just gonna say data. And you see this little yellow box that pops up here. I'm just assuming you're still new to Qt. Those little arrows up and down, you can actually use your arrow keys on the keyboard, or if you're good with the mouse, you can kind of click these. And you can see there's seven different constructors and you can just pick and choose which one you want. It's just ridiculously awesome. So I'm gonna say, hello. I'm just going to give it an array of characters there. Go ahead and grab this. Call this data. Save run. And again, this is going to display as if it's a string. Now, this is a little bit confusing. I almost wish like they had a special character, like a lowercase b or something in front of it, so you could see that's a byte array. But it's going to give you the string representation in the Q info. From here, let's go ahead and say Q byte array. And I want to do a buffer. This is pretty typical of some C++ programs where you need like some initialization buffer or something. So I want a size of 10 and I need a starting character and let's say for whatever reason they want a tab. There's multiple ways to do this but I'm going to use an escape sequence so slash t for tab and then you guessed it we can just q info this out and see exactly what it's going to look like. Oops I hit find instead of run forgive me there. In case you're wondering find is just control f but you can see now we have this buffer filled with tabs. And there's an easier way of doing this. It's called the fill method, which we're gonna talk about later, but I just wanted to show you you can do that right in the constructor. It's just ridiculously simple. All right, go away, find. We don't need to find anything. I know what I'm doing sometimes, but uh, all right. So Q byte array, let's say person. And this is something that I get asked quite a bit. So I wanted to do this, even though this isn't really a normal constructor. How do you turn a Q string into a Q byte array? Well, it's very simple. You could just say Q string, and let's say we had one floating out there, but I'm just going to construct it right here. And let's say Brian. And now Q string, you see, is just not compatible. It's not baked right into the constructor. So we have to tell Q string how to do this. So we say two, and then you have some options, for example, to Latin one, to local 8 bit, to UTF 8, to whatever you want. Basically, follow the help file again. Highlight in F1 brings it right up to what you're trying to do here. And it tells you what you're trying to do and some of the impacts of it. You may want to UTF 8. I'm just going to use to local 8 bit. But really, at the end of the day, it just works. I absolutely love this. So let's go ahead and grab this. And let's output the person. Save and run. Ta da! It all just works. Regardless of which constructor you use, it's very, very simple. 
All right, let's talk about sizing the array. And this often is a very lengthy, boring C++ conversation. There's better ways of doing it, but of course you gotta understand C++ to really talk about it. But Cubite Array, of course, makes it ridiculously simple. Before we do that, though, I'm going to just copy and paste a simple function that's gonna help us to reduce some clutter out on the screen. It's just a function called stats, and it's going to take a Cubite Array, and we're doing the address of. Now, special note, Cubite array is not a Q object. So we can copy this all we want, but I'm just avoiding a copy. And from there, we're going to print out the length and the capacity. Very important you understand the difference between length and capacity here. So let's highlight this, F1. Length is the same as size, very helpful. Okay, now that we actually understand here, returns the number of bytes in this byte array. The last byte in the byte array position is the size minus one. Kind of important you remember that later on because we'll end up doing something where we have to add one to get the correct position. All right, so basically size and length are interchangeable. They're the exact same thing. And the number of bytes in the array is really what it denotes. Now capacity, this is different. So I'm gonna highlight that F1, returns the maximum number of bytes that can be stored in the byte array without forcing a reallocation. So we're talking about memory here. Reallocation means that we've gone past the capacity here and Qt in the background is going to make a new array and reallocate it for you. And that can be expensive in terms of memory and time. So if you're really on some time sensitive thing, you're going to want to watch the capacity or you're going to end up doing a forced reallocation. All right. That's important because I get a lot of people that are like, hey, I stored, you know, 35 gigs of information inside a Qbyte array. Why is it taking forever to add more to it? And that's why you're forcing a reallocation. So back here, let's go ahead and say data. We're just going to reuse this little guy right here, our cubite array. We're going to say data dot reserve. Now reserve is going to do exactly what you think it is. So I'm going to say 25 and let's call that stats function on our data variable. Remember all stats is going to do is print out the length and the capacity and then the actual data here. So let's save run. Capac or, I'm sorry, the length is five, the capacity is 25. Notice the difference there. So we've reserved 25. If we go beyond that, so if we just start adding things and we go past 25, it will forcefully reallocate in the background. Now, if you're on a beefy computer or even a virtual machine like I got, that reallocation for 25 is nothing. I mean, you're talking, it's barely even worth talking about. But anyways, if you've got tons and tons of data or you're on a low-end device, like an embedded device, that reallocation can be very expensive. So keep those in mind. So reserve is basically saying go out and reserve that memory so you don't have to reallocate. Now comes the tricky part of the conversation. I'm going to say data.resize. And notice it's got kind of the same signature. So I'm going to resize this to 10. And let's go ahead and go stats. I can type data. There we go. Save run. And let's see what resize does to this. So now we're going to resize. The length is 10, the capacity is 25. Wait, what? What is going on here? You see what's happened is it's actually resized our array and filled in some characters there. And these are just hex zero is basically what you're looking at. So it's hello and then a bunch of zeros. Okay, so let's dive in and see what the difference here is. So if I F1 on reserve, attempts to allocate memory for at least bytes. You notice the word attempts. This isn't always going to be successful. And it also says, if you know in advance how large byte array be, you can call this function and if you call resize down here, you often likely get better performance because what it's going to do is it's going to plop that data in there and there's other code in the background, which makes this slightly faster. It says note, while resize will grow the capacity if needed, it never shrinks the capacity. So you're never going to lose data with resize. You can use squeeze, which is something we're not really gonna talk about, but this will release the memory that's not required. Just in case you're on a low-end device, you need to know how to do the opposite of resize. You can just squeeze it. So that's really the difference. Reserve and resize. Reserve is going to allocate memory. Resize will allocate and use, but it's got better performance because it does something better under the hood. 99% 99, 99 of the time, you're gonna want resize. 
So let's talk about truncating the data. Data dot truncate. So this is kind of the opposite here. I'm going to say I want eight. And we're just going to print this out. So what is truncate going to do in case you've never, ever heard of truncate? Truncates the byte array at the index position. If the position is beyond the end of the array, nothing happens. And they have a nice little example here how Stockholm truncated to five is going to be stock. So it's exactly what you think it's going to do. You're giving it a length and it's going to chop it off right at that length. Let's run this and see what truncate looks like. You notice how the length is eight, but the capacity is still 25. So it's removing those bytes, but it hasn't changed the capacity. Very important you understand the difference there, because a lot of people go, well, I truncated it. Why didn't the memory usage change? And of course, we can, if we wanted to, say data.clear. Clear does, and this is why I love Qt so much, does exactly what you think it would. All of these are self-descriptive. So the length is zero and the capacity is zero. Special note on clear is it does reduce the capacity. So a super fast way of releasing all that is just saying, go ahead and clear it and let Qt deal with all the nonsense in the background. Now comes the fun part. Let's modify some data. And again, this makes it just super ridiculously simple. So I'm going to say data dot, and we're going to go ahead and resize this just for clarity. I'm going to resize that to five, and then I'm going to say data dot fill. Now, this is the interesting bit here. Notice how it's taking a character, and it has only one way of doing this, a character and then an optional size. So I'm going to do a hex encoded, so I'm gonna say slash x and then the number, I'm gonna do 02. In case you're wondering how I magically knew that, it's just standard C++ escape sequence. Feel free to look that up on Google. So slash x says we're going to use 02 hex encoded. Bang, very, very simple. Now let's go ahead and see what this looks like. So stats, let's go ahead and say data. I shouldn't have said hex encoded, it's 02 in hex basically. Or character two. So now you see we have 02, 02, 02, 02, 02, 02. Length is five, capacity 16. Notice how it's automatically tried to figure out the capacity for us. And it's pretty much triple what we shoved in there. That is key to note that this is going to grow dynamically. So if you're really, really focused on memory usage, you may fight a little bit in the background with this. All right, now that being said, there are tips and tricks, but they're more advanced than what we're talking about, how to limit that memory usage. We're gonna try and cover that later on in the series. So data, let's go talk about replacing. So I'm gonna say replace. Now everybody gets super excited about replace, but this doesn't really work the way you think it would. I mean, maybe I'm just thick headed, but I'm gonna say, okay. So at the index zero, so the starting index, and then the length, I want one. This is key right here. Pay attention to what we're doing, zero to one. So we're basically doing one character, comma, and then we want to replace it with something. And I'm going to say Q byte array. And this is where everybody in the comments is gonna get super mad at me. I'm gonna say sweet. Now, pop quiz, what do you think this is going to do? What is this going to look like? We're going to, at zero to one, do a qubyte array of sweet. Well, this is more than one, so let's dive in and see how bad this gets here. And sure enough, this is what it looks like. Did not work the way you think it would. So what it's really done here is it's put it at the zero position, but if we count one, two, three, four versus one, two, three, four, five. So basically we've annihilated one of those bytes. That's why you got to be a little bit careful with that length, because we just overwrote that. That can get a little cumbersome. So let's try that again. And let's say we want to do 99 bytes. We know there isn't even 99 bytes in here. Notice how now it just says sweet, and it hasn't changed the capacity to 99. So really what we're doing is we're saying at the starting position, up until this length, go ahead and wipe out those bytes with whatever you want. So be a little bit careful with using replace. Now, 
that can get a little bit freaky, especially if you can't figure out why it's doing that, and which is why I wanted to really warn you about that. All right, so let's go ahead and say data.fill, and we're just going to fill this in with, um, why not, an asterisk. Now let's talk about insert. So I'm going to say data.insert. And this does exactly what you think it would. So we're going to insert. You can kind of feel free to go through these things and find the one that works for you. Again, that doesn't have to be selected on the screen for you to use it. C++ will just magically know. But I'm going to go ahead and say at the third position, remember this is a zero based index, I'm going to insert a cubite array. And let's go ahead and add this and then run it. Now I'll let you in on a little secret. A lot of people that record videos in, with code use a program that automatically types the code. Drop a comment below and let me know if you want me to start doing that or if you like watching me fumble with my keyboard. So anyways, what we've done is we've filled this with asterisks and then at the third position, we've inserted hello world. So you can see hello world. We've inserted that successfully. Insert is great, but notice what it did. It changed both the length and the capacity. So we're now growing automatically. That's automatic resizing of our array. All right, that can be a little bit scary if you're in a memory kind of constrained environment, but these computers nowadays don't really care. We've got more memory than what we know what to do with. So let's go ahead and append. So I'm gonna say data dot append. And this does exactly what you think it would. So I'm just going to impen, append an exclamation there. And of course, it's going to do exactly what you think. Just appended that character to the end of our byte array. Increase the length, not the capacity. Now let's see what we can do with removing. So I'm going to say data remove. Now this is a little bit challenging to wrap your head around at first because you may have lost some trust in this with replace and saw how that behaved, but it's actually pretty simple. So I'm gonna say from the index to the length, let's go with zero to three. So I'm gonna just chop off those first three asterisks. Is that the right word, asterisks? Astri, I don't know, somebody tell me what it is. We're gonna get rid of those first three bytes. And instead of, Three of them is just now hello world. But notice we have these two here still. So it's not gonna go ahead and automatically remove all of them is kind of, I guess, what I'm getting at here. So if you're looking for that, it's a different solution, but I just wanted you to be aware because I always get questions on why didn't it automatically remove them? You're talking about a starting position to a length, and that's exactly what it did. So let's talk about reading data. I mean, the whole point of this class isn't just to up data into it. It's quite often you're going to get data from something. It's going to be in the form of a qubyte array. It's a really great, I want to call it a container for data, but it's really not a container, it's an array. So if we just save and run, let's just for clarification, see what's actually in there. We have hello world and then an asterisk, an asterisk and an exclamation, okay. Makes simple sense here. Let's go ahead and say, we want to know the first asterisk position. So I'm gonna say int first equal data dot index of. Remember this is a zero based index. So it's going to give us in terms of zero base, meaning the first one's always going to be zero. And then we want to grab this, just do a little copy and paste action. Let's call this last. And let's go dot last index of. So we're basically saying, go find the first occurrence of this and then go find the last occurrence of this and put them in two different variables. From here, it's just ridiculously simple. We can just simply say something like, and I'm gonna just, for the sake of time, copy paste, start first in last and let's save and run and see where these positions are. So the first occurrence is at 11 and the last occurrence is 12. So 11 and 12 works as expected. This is actually extremely easy to work with and I absolutely love that. Now, if that 
wasn't easy enough. What if we wanted to get like a section of something here? And what do I mean by that? Well, we're going to use what's called mid, which stands for middle. We talked about this with QString, where we want to get something inside of it. So I'm going to say if the first is greater than negative one, because index and I'm sorry, index of and last index of are going to return negative one if it didn't find it. And the last is greater than negative one. Then I want to go ahead and do something. I'm going to say Q info. We're going to say data. We want to get something in the middle or mid. And then, of course, we got to give it an index. And it's a zero based index. So I'm just going to say the first, comma. And then this is where I said, remember how it's reducing one. I said this kind of in the beginning of this video. And it's a zero based array. This is what we need to do here. We're going to take the last index minus the first index and then plus one. You may be looking at that going, wait, what? Let's go ahead and run this and see what it does. Notice how we have two asterisks. Astri. I, I gotta figure out what that is. It's gonna drive me nuts. Point is, we had to add that additional one because it's a zero base and it's looking for the link. So we said, looking at our code here, we want to go at the first position, but then we want a length, not an ending position. So this is really what this little code here is doing is getting the length, which is our last position minus the first position, but then it's only going to have one number lower. So we need to add one to get the two. Just for clarification, if you don't do that, you're not going to get both of them. You're going to get just one of them at the speed of this compiler. There we go. See, ta-da, just one. So if you're ever short on something using the mid, always refer back and go, oh, I know why. I have to get the length plus one because this is a zero-based index. There's other reasons why. It's not so much because it's a zero-based index, but just kind of burn that in your memory and you'll never forget because I've made that mistake time and time again. All right, now let's go ahead and say data.clear because I'm just going to clear all that garbage data out and say data.append. I'm just going to add my name. We're just going to start with a fresh set of data here. And we want a nice for loop. So I'm going to say for int i equals zero because this is a zero based index. i is less than data. And we want the length. Notice I'm using length, not capacity, because we want to know the actual bytes that are in there. And then we're going to say i plus plus. And then I want to qinfo that out and say qinfo. data dot at. So you can do data dot at, or and I love doing this, or you can do it the way you're pretty much used to if you've worked with just plain old C++. You don't have to do it the cute way of doing things. So let's go ahead and save and run. And you can see, there it goes. You can do at or just the normal C++ way. It doesn't really matter. Now you may be wondering, why use add at all? F1 on the keyboard returns the bytes at the index of the position of the byte array must be a valid index. So this is actually doing range checking, but it does say C the operator. So they are virtually identical. Now, that being said, older versions of Qt, I have noticed minute little differences between these two, but it was very rare if I went outside the range. Uh, when I say older, we're talking very, very older versions of Qt. So let's go ahead and do a for each because I personally love for each. And we want to know each character in our data. So I'm going to say Q info. And it's going to do exactly what you think it would do. I mean, there's really I'd love to turn this into a long, boring conversation, but it's just going to print it out. It's just very simple, very easy to work with. But that's the whole point of the class is that it does make this ridiculously simple. And I actually compliment it when I say it's boring because it is boring. Once you really get used to it, you're just like, okay, whoopie do a cubite array. But it has all this functionality baked into it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say for each, and I'm going to say auto item data dot split. 
So remember what splitting does, it's a lot like splitting firewood, we're gonna say, take that data, look for this occurrence, and then split it into something else. And I wanna just say, item, let's go ahead and print that item out. So now you can very easily take your array and split it into multiple items, in this case, two different items. Again, calling this boring is a compliment because it's so boring it makes our lives ridiculously easy. Okay, to wrap this video up, let's talk about encoding the data. And I, again, we're literally just scratching the tip of the iceberg on what a qubyte array can do. But you're going to work with qubyte array more than you think once you start diving into Q. So let's take a look at what our little array looks like. So the normal is just my name, Brian Cairns, or feel free to put in your name, whatever you want. But let's go ahead and look at this and say we want to repeat that. So rather than do some for loop, we can just say repeat, or I should say repeated. And we're going to repeat that three times just because we like to annoy people. And it does exactly what you think it would. Now, that seems very simplistic, and it actually is. So let's start diving into a couple more, well, a little bit more difficult to wrap your head around examples. So let's look at a common scenario. I'm going to say data.end, and we're going to add in qubyte array. And we're going to add what's called white space. And this is actually very common where you'll have like somebody types a tab and then they hit a hard return and a line feed. But if you print this out, it's not actually a printable character. It's just white space. Then we're also going to say data dot insert. And we want to insert at the first position or the zero. We're going to say Q byte array. And I've seen people do this. They'll go. Let's do that again. One, two, three. There we go. I wanted to make sure I got it right, but just because, why not? Let's just do this, and then let's just add in a tab, and another, and another, just because people and users are annoying. They make mistakes. So all of this is white space. Uh-oh. So what does this actually do? Well, let's go ahead and see. So I'm going to say normal, and let's run this and see what normal now looks like. Normal is anything but normal. You see, we've got this lot of spaces with some tabs and then my name and some tabs and then a return line feed. How do we get all of that out of there? I don't want any of that. Well, let's rename this to trimmed. And then let's say, put normal back down there. Actually, let's call this actual. Actually, let's call it actual. There we go. That way we can see the difference between the two. All right, so our trimmed version is this nice, neat name, and then our actual has not been modified. So it's just returning another qubyte array with all that garbage stripped out of there. Now, somebody may be going, well, I don't understand. How do you change your original qubyte array? It's very simple. You just say data equal data dot trimmed. Somebody down in the comments may yell at me for doing that because we're reusing that variable. But under the hood, basically, C++ and Qt are going to wipe that out and make a copy of it and replace it with a copy. So it just works. Now, let's go ahead and look at something I actually get asked constantly. How do you convert to and from hex encoding? So you say qubyte array. And let's call this, I need a, a really good name, hex, why not? Call this data dot two. Now, when you say two, it's going to give you a list of all the things that are baked right in that you can convert it to. And you notice two hex is right up here. So that's right, it's literally just that simple. Say run, let's see what the two hex now looks like. There it is. There's the hex representation of that. That is really cool. Now let's actually, 
I love saying that. Let's actually print the actual here. That way we know that we've now modified that. Just so if somebody coming back says, wait a minute. So now that we've got this hex, how do we convert it from hex back to a normal cubite array? It's actually just as simple. So I'm going to say cubite array. Let's call this from hex equal. And I'm going to use the static function cubite array from hex. And we'll just give it our hex encoded cubite array. And then we can just reuse this real quick. Say run, and let's see what that looks like. All right, so we've switched our actual back to Brian Karen's. Here's the hex encoded, and then from hex, we have decoded it back into the plain text. Ridiculously simple, and it's baked right into the class. We can actually, if we wanted to, do the same thing, but for base64 encoding. If you don't know what base64 encoding is, it's a, it's a standard encoded, I want to say a standard coding way of sending data back and forth across the internet. When you send an email, usually it's base64 encoded. So we're just going to say to base64 and see the base64 encoded version and then from base64. And again, we can just use the static. You don't have to, but you can just because somebody out there will say, hey, you don't actually need to create an instance of the class. And let's call this from base64. It really is that simple. I know I whip right through that, but once you understand the pattern, again, this becomes boring and boring is a compliment because it's that easy to work with. So from hex is the plain text and then base64 encoded and then base64 decoded is back to my name. It's just that simple. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can find the source code out on github.com. If you need additional help, myself and thousands of other developers are hanging out in the Void Realms Facebook group. This is a large group with lots of developers and we talk about everything technology related, not just the technology that you just watched. And if you want official training, I do develop courses out on udemy.com. This is official classroom style training. If you go out there and the course you're looking for is just simply not there, drop me a note. I'm either working on it or I will actually develop it. I will put a link down below for all three of those. And as always, help me help you. Smash that like and subscribe button. The more popular these videos become, the more I'll create and publish out on YouTube. Thank you for watching.